everybody. Welcome to the Sally Allen podcast. I am so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're watching and I am so grateful and thankful for you all. Um, as you know, we use this platform to share stories of resilience. And today I have a friend. Well, I just met her a few days ago uh, on Facebook and we connected so well. And I absolutely love her story and can't wait for her to share her story. Her name is Sally Wurr and she is an international author, uh, speaker and coach. Uh, she has this incredible story. She almost, almost published a book called, and I, I need to say this, it's, it's so, it's so cute. Um, me, we, me. And some of her resiliency will be based on the me, we, me, but she ended up published a book called The Power of Awakening. I'm so disappointed she changed the name, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a good book anyways. So anyway, with that said, I want to introduce Miss Sally Wurr. Sally, welcome to the Sally Allen Podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. I, I like always connecting with another Sally in this world, right? It's just that we all answer when someone calls our name. It's, it's just a fun thing. That's right. That's right. And the one thing I love about her is she is always bubbly. Like her personality is just uh, uh, just always bubbly. She says to me, I wake up like this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I love it. I, I do. Does it doesn't matter. All all the time of day, daytime, nighttime, mornings, noon. <laughs> That's just who you are. That's what you get. Yeah, yeah. Pretty so much. Sally, when we when we first talked about your story and what you will be sharing, you started talking. What fascinated me was the me we, me, and I never heard it put that way. And there is like resiliency interwoven into the me, we, me in your story. Tell us a little bit about that. I, I found myself in a, in a spot, right? Uh, where when we're in our late teens, early 20s, some people a little bit later even, it's all about me. What are you going to do with your life? What are your activities? expectations? What are your goals? Where are you going? You know, you're in the driver's seat of your own life. Where are you taking it? And we have all these dreams and goals. And some of us get married. And at at that juncture, you, everything is and from being a me becomes a we. It's where will we go out to dinner? Where will we spend our money? Where will we do this? It's partnership. And a lot of people get offended when I say that a marriage is a business partnership, but it truly is. I mean, it's a contract, right? Um, we like to not get into that in too much depth, but uh, all healthy relationships understand that you're doing things as a we and mm -hmm. and the others should not run off and do things as a me quite as often. But in my particular case, you know, I was married for 45 years, and then my husband got cancer and died four months after after diagnosis, and I became this me again. So how do you define yourself, define yourself when you're in that second me? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's just a, a, a crazy time. And it doesn't matter if, if you lose your significant other from, you know, death, divorce, separation, you know, maybe you just drift apart and go your own different directions. It doesn't really matter. But when you've been a we for quite a while and now you become a me again, how do you how do you get yourself back in the driver's seat and, and take your take your life the way you want it to be? Um, and what a lot of people, one of the things that I like to, to to talk about is that resiliency and and how do you overcome the obstacles and the adver adversities in life, right? And what I find is, is many people stick their head in the sand and hope it's going to go away. And I, and I, my favorite, my favorite quote is, I've got two of them, but my favorite one is, the problem is not the problem. It's our reaction to the problem that is the problem. Yeah, and I like that a lot. It, I, I, I really like yeah. that a lot. And, um, you know, I'm sorry about your husband's passing. How long since he's yeah. passed? It will be three years in July. Three so, years in July. So yeah, you've so been still, with your husband for 45 years. 47 if you count the two years of dating prior to getting married, yes. So, 47 years for, you were a we. We, And yeah. now, interestingly, you've, you've become a me again. So what are yeah. some of the challenges that you found when you became a me again, right? Because I know you said you do everything together, but there's just some things your husband do, and there's just some things that you do, right? So, so what were some of those challenges you went through? 
you know, one of them was we were a two corporation family, right? So he had his own company that he did. He worked away from the house, but it was his corporation. I had my own. I've always worked from home and, and that was pretty easy for me to maintain that because I, I was here. But, you know, one of the biggest things, challenges I had to do is I had to, I had to business and, and, and he didn't have employees. He just worked on his own. And, and that, you know, if you're not, if you're not familiar with what your spouse does for a living, that could be really a mess. You know, thankfully, my husband are both, and, and there again, I know I'm a, I'm an international speaker, author, and coach, but I also have my own company that I do employee benefits had for, done it for over thirty years. So I understood the insurance arena because we were both in it. So. A lot of the obstacles I went through, I at least knew what the steps were. So because we both were in life insurance arena, I knew what to do. And and that's where I, I share with a lot of people, don't be hiding your assets, right? Don't hide your assets from family members. Just don't. Because when, when something happens and you have to go locate them, you know, if you don't know, you don't you, you just don't know what you don't know. And, and in the case of my husband, he had three computers and we could not get any of the passwords to work on those three computers. Wow. Wow. But don't ever count on a computer. Don't ever count on getting into your spouse's computer because it may not happen. Um, thankfully, we didn't need it. I just moved on. But there again, it's I knew I could move on without needing to get into that computer system. Uh, the other on, on a personal level. Yeah, you got to take out the trash when the got to remember that the trash comes on Friday. Take that trash out. Um, you only you'll miss it a couple times when you remember that you need to put that on a calendar. Uh, you know, I live in Colorado. I live in the foothills of the Rockies. So guess what happens? It snows. So who's going to shovel the driveway? Well, we used to do it. That used to be a wee thing, right? We'd both get out there and shovel the driveway. Well, it now became my responsibility if I wanted to go somewhere. You go from having two paychecks, to one paycheck. Biggie. Yeah. Biggie. Um, if you're not prepared for it, right? And so part of what I like to share with people, and I shared in Power of Awakening and, and Power of Purpose books, is how do you make sure that you've got money put away for those rainy days. And I know it's tough, but there are ways of doing it that it doesn't hurt as bad as when rainy days hit and you need some resilience and grit. You also need cash. Yes, totally. Uh, you totally. just need cash. Yeah. And so, so I'm trying to think of this. There's other, uh, you know, I'm mowing, right? I don't, I don't mow lawns. I'm allergic to grass. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'm blessed, you know, I have a I have a good career of my own. So thankfully, I was fairly independent to begin with. And um, I, I was at an event just recently and, and I talked about, you know, when my husband passed away that, you know, the next day I was on the phone with all of the contacts I knew of that he had to let them know that he had passed away and and that we needed to start shutting some things down and other people need to take over. And this girl said, she came up to me and she gave a hug. She you know, says, when my dad passed away, my mom went dead for two years. I said, you know, I hear that a lot. And and I, I don't begrudge anybody in how they handle losses um, because grief is handled personally. Some people tell the world and want the world to hug them and give them love. And other people like myself, I mean, I, I saw people in my larger circle of, of contacts that, that don't know my husband got sick and died. I mean, we're at that two and a half year mark. I, I had some, somebody just a month and a half ago say, hey, how's your husband doing? And I went, hmm, okay, you didn't get that memo. So so let's back up a little bit. Um, I'm thinking, I'm li sitting and listening here, like your husband passed away and the day, like, or the day after you're on the phone, your head is clear, you're calling people, and you're doing what, what you need to get done. It's just, it's, it, is it adrenaline or is that who you've always been? It's who I've always been. And, you know, I was, you gotta, you have, you have to get business done 
first. It's important that, um, and perhaps that's that's me, right? That's my personality type. You need to get business done first. And my guess is, is if if I looked back, if I looked back really in a lot of detail, if I video recorded myself during that first week, I was probably on automatic pilot. And it's only because of my background, right? I could be on automatic pilot because I, I knew I knew the steps that need to be done. I had I was blessed. My husband and I I had developed a a spreadsheet that we called our asset sheet many, many years prior. So in case anything were to happen to one of us, we could just go down and you know, like life insurance, who's the company with, and policy number, phone number, email, mailing address. And so I was able to keep my brain focused on what needed to be done. And I just didn't let those other thoughts creep in until I got business taken care of first. Uh, But, you know, if I were to look at that recording, if I over again, I, I probably wasn't as composed as I think I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I mean, we're two and a half years out and there wasn't a whole lot I missed. There just yeah. wasn't a whole lot I missed. But I, I just think it's because I, I am a business owner and I, I didn't want to lose my company and I couldn't take on his company because I didn't have the securities licenses to do so. Yeah, I think so there was it speaks, just a matter Sally, of shutting um, it down. As you're speaking, the one thing that's that's running through my head is that when you build a strong foundation, which you've built, one, you have your business, so you under, you're business minded, so you understand what you need to get done. Yeah. But your strong foundation is also in your administrative organizational skills that you and your husband took care of everything while you didn't know, you yeah. know you couldn't get in his computer and some of the things you didn't know about his business for the most part together you guys did a good job to organize your life that you had a spreadsheet and you knew who you needed to call so so that's not something you needed to think about right your foundation was laid also because you are a resilient person from what you know a little I've learned about you so you just took that and you ran with it I feel and correct me if I'm wrong when when we are you know when 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 the spotlight is on us and we are hit with pressure our true our true nature and who we are comes out very much so very much so and i just think that you know i I talk a lot about the tools in our toolbox right we're all we're all born with a certain set of tools Mm -hmm. and then the rest we learn along the way through adversity and and grit and and just you know, and the people that we surround ourselves with, right? I mean, that's a really important aspect of who I am and where I've always been is who do I hang out with, mm. you know, um, and who can I learn from? Because, you know, I, I was never going to be a rocket scientist. I was never going to be an astronaut. You know, I don't have the math and science skills that I have a lot of friends that are rocket scientists, right? Because of where I live. Um, And trust me, I don't have that skill set, but they don't have my skill set either, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have my skill set. And and, uh, someone once reminded me of a quote from Mark Twain. It said, uh, the best two days in your life are the day that you're born and the day you find out why. And I've always felt my why was to share what I've learned with other people so that they could take the bits and pieces that fit for them at that particular time in life and move on. Yeah. You know, um, there's a, there was a story of uh, the, the actress Rue McClanahan many, many, many years ago, she did a speech and I think it was the Grammys or Oscars or one of those, one of those shows many, many years ago. And, and she says a lesson that she learned very young in life when is that she didn't get a part in a in a show that she really wanted to do, and the the producer told her it's because she wasn't photogenic enough. Well, it like really burst her bubble because she thought she was pretty hot stuff at the time, right? And she is she's a, she's a gorgeous woman. And she says her mom told her she says you know what in life there are people that are going to come into your life and out of your life that are going to give you boosts, boost you up, feed your ego. And be there to help you along the way. And then there are going to be the people that kick you. 
the person kicked her and said, you're not photogenic enough for what we want. And, you know, the important factor is to learn who those people are. And when given an opportunity, boost those that boosted you and occasionally kick those that kicked you. And I, and I, and I look at that and I say, there are people in our life and sometimes the people that are the closest to us that aren't supportive of what you want to do and the things that you're doing in life. And you have to understand and see it from their perspective a little bit in, are they fearful because they're afraid you're going to get knocked down? Someone's going to kick you along the way. Are they fearful that you're going to leave them behind? I don't try to keep leave people behind too often, but you know, I kind of, I think we, I'm in, I'm in good company here. I think we all, Present company runs at about a Mach four, right? I mean, our speed of light is we just move fast and yeah. and uh, climb over through under. However, we need to get through our adversity in life, we find a way to do it, or we let it go. Yeah, there are some things that you just I can't bring my husband back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't bring him back, and and he we we certainly my husband as well as medical science gave it every possible shot they could to stop the cancer's growth and it didn't it was it was marching on regardless uh, so you have to let those things go that you can't control and uh, keep a good good thought patterns of the things that you can yeah I, I do want to go back to what you said about people like I was listening to a development call this morning and one of the things um, I heard that really made me stop like really mentally and and took a mental look around me is the, you know, the people you hang out with now, right, are the people, it's, it's, it's who you will emulate the next five years from now. That's who you will become the next five years from now. So as I was driving, I, I stopped to really think, I'm like, who am I hanging out with? And do I want to be I'm sorry, Austin behind the decks is waving at me. <laughs> Maybe I want to be like Austin. <laughs> sorry, we digressed a little bit. But but it's good to do that check. And talking about Austin, one of the things we were just talking about, um, because he, he was going to do a podcast on something, and I'm like, you don't want to burn those bridges. And one of the things he said, I've built new bridges, though. Now I've built bridges of concrete. Right. And he's referring to the people that he has put around him. Um, he, he's he's built those bridges of strong people. And he knows that those people will be here for him, even if it's, you know, we say in life, things are for a season. People are for a season. And right now he's in a season where he is he, he's surrounded by blocks of concrete and strong people who's going to help him grow and get to where he is. So what was my point to that? It's important who you hang out with and the people that you have in your life. So um, thank you for sharing that. So that's one of, one of the other things that helped you through. Awesome. Awesome. So now how about, but I, but um, how about, I lost my trend of thought because you were going to say something. You go ahead. No, I was going to say, as, as much as I believe in building and I have a strong fortress around me as well, I remind people and I, and I discovered it, you know, sadly with my husband getting sick and passing away, which it, right in the middle of COVID, right, is that the closest hand for help is attached to your own arm, mm -hmm. and make sure you make sure you are strong enough when those people that you think are your concrete aren't. Mm -hmm. I like that. Just yeah. they show up in those unlikely places. Yeah. Yeah, take the tools you can from them, learn from them. But at some point, you've got to grow up, right? And stop drinking that milk and start yeah. eating solid food and, and be your own person. So what is what was your grieving process? Everybody has different ways that they grieve when they lose someone close. What was your, Sally? Um, I'm When it comes to things like a grieving process or many other aspects of my personality type, I typically am, am very introspective. I don't talk about it. My daughter and I talk about it. I talk with a few people. Clearly, I talk more about it now. I'm, I'm fairly comfortable talking about it now. Uh, but it's I think it's just sharing the story, sharing pictures, sharing dreams, sharing memories. 
Hey, uh, many people have said to me, Sally, why are you, you're so happy? How can you be so happy when your husband just died like two and a half years ago? And I said, well, you know, it's sad to say, but you know, I'm sorry that he's gone and, and I miss him, but he died. I didn't. Mm. And I think that's really important to, to think about. That doesn't mean that I don't miss him and, and all those parts and parcels about the grieving process, but life is for the living. And so there are maybe melancholy moments. I like to refer to them as where I sit back and I say, well, darn, this kind of sucks, right? <laughs> but but then I pop back up and I say, but I am blessed with this life that I have. And my husband and I are, you know, he left me in a good place because of all the things that we we put in place prior, right? You know, those things of, uh, I talk I talk in depth about, you know, in the early days of marriage, we had, we put money into savings and mutual funds and investment vehicles, like we paid our gas bill. It was just a part of how we figured out, here's our income and how do we break it out? Still living life, but but putting money away for that time in our life where we can retire and do what we want to do or, you know, when something happens to the other person, you know, and they, they, they die sooner than they think they're going to die. Not that any of us know when we're going to die, but, you know, a lot of us think that we're going to live, you know, I want to live till I'm 150, right? But I want to be healthy for it. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything. I could die. I could die tonight. I mean, it's not guaranteed that I'm, I have any specific lifespan here on earth, but I think grieving is, is personal and you have to, you have to be very, very cognizant, and I've become much more so now after going through this, that people have to do what they have to do. I, I know many, many people that do just go to bed. They just, they don't even want to get up. They don't, they're, they're that, that's their grieving process and bless them, hug them, bless them, help them. Uh, that was not mine. Uh, my time is just, uh, every morning I would get up with my coffee and I would journal. Every day that from the morning, from the day that he got sick, I started a journal and I journaled every single day and, and did it daily up until about six months ago. And, you know, I got so busy with, with book tours that, you know, the, 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 the journaling wasn't as necessary anymore because I was so much out front in the Facebook world and, you know, photos and, conversations and podcasts and I mean you just the running the gamut right that you do when you have several books you know I have two of my first two my power of awakening power of purpose they were on a billboard in Times Square they've been there twice another book that I am a co-author in called hold my crown it's women with grit share stories of resilience that that's going around the world I and mean, we've just hit so many people but They've been on the billboards in New York's Times Square a couple times now. And you just get a lot of, you know, it, 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 it just blows everything out of the stratosphere, right? It does. I, I Congratulations for that. So Thank congratulations. You. I'm so excited for you, Sally. But I want to go back to things I heard you said without you saying it. Um, gratitude. One of the things uh, that help, you know, help you to get through what you were going through when your husband passed was gratitude. You embrace, like, it, you know, simple things you wake up when you're thankful for. And then the next one was um, just writing and writing everything you were feeling. Yeah. Writing everything I was feeling, what I was experiencing. Um, because we didn't know when, you know, the morning that he went for a walk, March 22nd of 2020, he went for a morning walk and COVID was just starting. We didn't really know much about it. Right. And he, when he got back to the house, it, I thought he, he, he walked like he'd had a stroke. And so that was the immediate thought pattern. And so I got him to the ER fairly quickly because I, I, we needed to get on it right away. And, and of course we discovered after a CT scan and stuff, when they were trying to figure out where the stroke might have been at, that he had, you know, more than 30 brain tumors. Wow. And they said they just stopped counting at 30. We, you know, my husband and I both looked at each other like deer in headlights. We we're going, what do you mean brain tumors? And the ER physician said, 
and didn't know you had brain tumors because he thought we knew. And we go, no, my husband was a severe asthmatic and always had bad headaches. And they don't give you brain scans, right? They don't give you brain scans just to give you a brain scan. And, um, and when you're hit with something that massive and, and really with the ER physician a little bit off the cuff, you, you've got to figure out a way to, um, mentally prioritize your thought patterns, right? And I like to think of my brain as a file, as file cabinets. And so you open up that file and you go, oh my gosh, what's going on? And how am I going to, how are we going to, to figure this out? But truthfully, I was also saying, how am I, me, how am I going to figure this out? Because it's not happening to me. So how much do you take on as a person that is the caregiver versus the person that it's happening to? Because those are two very different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And depending on the on your loved one, how much control do they really want to have? And, and I gave my husband full control over how he wanted to fight this cancer. Um, and so for me, journaling my way of writing my thoughts and feelings without sharing them with him because he's not a Google person like I am. So I was already Googling what is the outcome and the different things that we could do for this, this type of cancer. And, and I knew that four to six months was the life expectancy, uh -huh. but you can't share that. You don't share that with your loved one. Right. Right. So he was, didn't the doctors tell him how long he had? No. I, so many people tell me that the doctors told them that, you know, you, you can expect blah, 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 blah. My husband's doctors never said that. Mm. My husband asked him, how bad is my cancer? And the oncologist said from a, on a scale of one to 10, solid nine. Mm. My husband just said, got it. You know, I beat cancer once before. I'll beat it again. No problem. Okay. And so, you know, that, and that's his mindset. And I allowed him, I, I, I told him nothing different. Mm. Nothing different because that was not, there are some things you have to understand that you have to keep it, you have to keep bottled up. And so my way of keeping it bottled up was to write about it and my feelings and my thoughts. And, and, uh, you know, as I said, I, it went on way past him passing and, and sure enough, I mean, he expectancy was four to six months and he, he made it four months in one week. Wow. And um, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, and bottom line is with cancer, anything that's that, that fast moving, you're thankful that they don't suffer very long because cancers are really ugly disease. And, you know, there are some cancers that people can fight and have a very good outcome, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of cancers. I mean, I look at childhood cancers and, and breast cancer and a lot of those cancers that there, there's a very high resiliency and lifespan length of life that is added to those. And there are other cancers that they're, they, when they get you, you cannot bring a brain back that's been eaten up by cancer. Yeah. Sally, what, bring I back. See, it's gone. what I see is a strong, like you are a very strong, logical, practical and analytical woman. You don't yes, I let would. the emotions go run, you know, run rampant or get the better of you. So I take, yeah, I take the circumstances mm -hmm. that I am given mm -hmm. and I don't, don't put my head in the sand. I hit them head on. Yes, yes, you head definitely on. do. And this has been so inspiring. So thank you for sharing your process, your story and what you have been through. What's a takeaway for our audience today? Uh, take away for the audience. You know what? Live your life, right? Uh, just live your life and make it the best that it can possibly be because we're all given one life, life on this plane of earth, right? This one body to, to take us where we're supposed to be going. So be good to yourself. You just Thank be good you. to yourself and, and make sure that you put yourself in the driver's seat of your own life. Don't allow somebody else's circumstances to derail you. Yes, I like that. Thank you so much again for appearing in our podcast and for sharing your story. Um, you know, I, I always say it's never too late to start living resiliently. And 
one of the ways I see is that grief comes in many forms and, and everyone grieves differently, like Sally said. And um, whatever your process is, you know, it takes time. So while some of us are more logical and not emotional, that's okay to just, you know, do you and grieve the way uh, you need to and as long as you need to. Um, thank you again for listening to our podcast. If you like our podcast, rate, review, and share with your friends. And thanks to Austin Behind the Decks and Sticky Paw Studio.